All right. Good morning and welcome, everybody, to another C-Mask episode. Unfortunately, we're missing the man, Tim Gordon. He's not feeling the greatest, so we hope you feel better, Tim. I'm here with Will and Nick. Gentlemen, how are we doing this fine Friday morning? Or right, afternoon Mike. for you, Will. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Good afternoon. Looking forward to another C-Mask episode with you two. Yeah, man. Nick, how are we doing, bro? I know I'm going to see you tomorrow, God willing. Yeah, in about uh, 26 hours. Looking forward to it. Let's go. Awesome. We got to film some content for either C-Mask or my channel, whichever. Okay, so I think this is a very important topic. I don't think it can be touched upon enough. Um, if it wasn't for, and I'm going to go ahead and just say this outright too, if it wasn't for C-Mask and for what you guys are doing, I guess what we're doing now that I'm on the panel, I don't know if I would have returned to the church. And there was a, a post in particular from December of 2022 that was impactful on me, Will, that you made that was just so good. But before I get to that, and that was on the masculinity of Christ. Oh, did Tim just, Tim's joining us. Tim's we'll, here. Uh, we'll, Let's go. Awesome. So the, there's a crisis of masculinity in the church, right? And I think, again, this isn't something that's touched on enough. I know we can kind of go at it with bullet points, but I really want to try to parse this one out. I have some thoughts on this. And the first question, Tim, it's good to have you, man. thought you weren't going to join us, just by the way. Welcome Yo. back. Hey, Tim. Good to be here. Hate sitting it out. What's up? How are you guys? A little under good. the weather. Good, man. Sorry, good to see on. you, bro. Yeah, so today, uh, Tim, we're talking about the crisis of masculinity in the church um why men are leaving the church how we get them back and the masculinity of christ so maybe this could be a two-parter but so the first question that i want to kind of dive into is do you think this was deliberate or was it a, a sort of a slow creeping side effect i hate to sound like that guy um just to kind of get some initial thoughts out there and i'm not a state of a contest you guys know this everybody knows this hopefully but it seems like when after vatican ii there was this slow degeneration of the rawness and the realness of of the faith, and it's become, become sort of replaced by this Karen-esque Catholicism. No offense to my wife. Her name is Karen. She's the mm -hmm. antithesis to the mean <laughs> Karen. <laughs> so, guys, was this deliberate, slow-creeping side effect? How did this happen? Will, we'll start with you. I was just thinking, you know that? cartoon show from when i was a kid anyway called pinky in the brain do you guys remember mm -hmm. that oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and they're like mm -hmm. what are we gonna talk about today what are we gonna do about how Try to take, to over, take the world? over the world that's it i just felt like when mike said it's time to talk about the crisis of masculinity in the church that's like us but that's what we always talk about that's just another day another sea mask episode so it feels good to be here it's deliberate for sure it's all part of the agenda that we've outlined in many episodes. Vatican II as a turning point. I'm not sure it's as clear cut as that. It didn't define any dogma officially. And the fact that it was the turning point to the extent that it was, was only possible because I think things had started to get weaker even before that. It's more like a symptom of the fact there were underlying problems. So you can go back further than Vatican II, in my opinion, and find some of the uh, weaknesses that allowed feminism to make inroads into the church. We'll get into why that is later, but in terms of what the aim is, it's a no-brainer. It's an undermining of patriarchy. And if you want to do that, what are you going to go for? The Catholic Church is target number one. Super well said. Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I don't have the the historical expertise that I know Tim does with respect to um, feminism in the church, but I do remember, uh, I do have two observations that I think would fill this in. The first was, I remember two years ago, Tim, correct me, maybe one year ago, Francis said that the church is too masculine and that we need to make it more feminine, explicitly said it, we need to make it more feminine. It's like a month ago, two two months ago. Yeah. Was it really that recent? Literally. Yeah, it was. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's, but Francis is, is, um, the product of like a 200 year plan here. And oddly enough, the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita was intercepted somewhere in the vicinity of the 1848 Seneca Falls convention, um, which does seem to be sort of the, the start of a lot of this stuff. And so, first observation was Francis's 
comment there. Um, and then the second was something that I've talked to Tim about, I think off the show, but the um, fact that women, the lay women are the most religious characters in the life of the church. Like if you go to a mass and you look around like during the homily, you'll see like the, the women are gone. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And if you, if you go to the home, it's like the women are the ones praying with the kids before bed. The women are the ones saying grace. The women are, are the ones singing the songs. It's all performed by women. And when that is observed by men, I think the natural instinct is to then for the man to withdraw from that position because it's like, oh, I don't want to do what the girls are doing. Um, as silly as that sounds, it's just like when you experience religion as a guy, especially as a young guy, and the only people engaged or caring about the practice of religion itself are women that you really don't like. They're, they're not kind. They don't like you. They don't build you up and encourage you. I think from young to old men, they just kind of withdraw. So that's not answering your question of whether or not it's, in, it's intentional. It's just more of a forensic observation of my experience of the faith from a very young age. It was, it was just all women doing religion. Yeah, total yeah. failure on, uh, on the men to uphold their leadership in the home that they've completely abdicated. Was it at that Seneca Falls convention? Tim, I was just listening to your recent uh, video. It was so good. Um, on that, those five points of, of feminism, I believe it was five points. W was it at that point that they were talking about how um, they can sort of dismantle the American family by uh, subverting the patriarch's power? Was that was that was it at that convention? Yeah, it was exactly there. Uh, this is the memorialized doc. It will take you about seven minutes to read through. It's very very thin. I can't even believe I spent money on this shit. Yo, when did you <laughs> get that? That's we should put that in. That's super cool that you have that. Yeah, I've I've had it um since I wrote a uh, case for patriarchy. But oh, they dang. yeah, it's kind of a cross. I mean, so I say it's it's basically five goals at Seneca Falls, 1848, that are recognizable as those five goals of the 1970 boardroom chant. And I'm I'm just dissolving any real distinction between first wave and second wave feminism. But they're not really goals. They're <clears throat> what they are, properly speaking, is um kind of species genus like w what what do we want to do we want to rage wage revolution How, well what kind of revolution you know i'll read it to you the 1970s thing um it goes like this uh why are we here today the chairwoman asked of this roundtable feminist meeting in new york city in the early 1970s to make revolution so i say that's goal one they they answered what kind of revolution, she replied, the cultural revolution they chanted, that's gold too, which is the family. How do we make cultural revolution, she demanded, by destroying the American family, goal three, they answered. How do we destroy the family, she came back, by destroying the American patriarch, capital A, capital P, they cried exuberantly, that's four. How do we destroy the patriarch, um, she probed, by taking away his power, how do we destroy that, or how do we do that, by destroying monogamy, they shouted. And then in, in this, this is page 141 of this excellent book. Um, I start going through and I showing, okay, these are the five goals laid out here. And so four or five, dis destroying the patriarch. Remember, patriarchy is bimodal. Um, is there's a clerical patriarchy and a lay patriarchy. They they want to destroy both. So they actually mention here, but not even here, that they want women in the clergy. They have to get women in the clergy, which is what pra Francis is really specifically doing now. Um, and then you destroy the lay patriarchy by basically Daphne Moon complex, uh, Moon Beasley complex, which is making lay women attractive and sexy and good and feminine before marriage, but not after. Specifically take it away after. And, um, and you also destroy the clerical patriarchy by making the men uh, who go there um, lavender, uh, for lack of a better term. And that was something that was called out by the Virgin Mary at Our Lady of Good Success um, in like the 1500s at Quito, Ecuador. She said in the late 20th century, the um, 
the uh, clergy will become um, morally, especially sexually corrupted, meaning, you know, they'll become um, fruitcakes. And so that's, that's basically what it was to destroy the whole patriarchy, to destroy manliness, um, turn the, turn the, um, the, the clerical patriarchy lavender and turn the, the lay patriarchy, um, gender dysphoric, a bunch of guys being controlled by their wives. And that's, that's been enough to destroy manliness inside and outside of Christendom. But I, I do think it is related to other events of the late 20th century. I, I Again, nothing in the documents of Vatican II, but I think it all kind of is part of the, the Satan's plan for the, you know, the final attack on the um, world. It, it was a final attack on the world, as Sister Lucy said in 1917, would be the most ramped up explicit attack on the family and you do it by attacking the clerical patriarch and the lay patriarch. Super well said. I think Eric Ibarra kind of nailed it when he said that the the church has a skin problem. The organs are perfectly intact and healthy, um, but there seems to be this this tumor, this malignancy that's on the surface. That's luckily just on the surface. Um, and it's funny how many how many people attach themselves to the the how horrific you know they think Vatican II was, despite not defining any kind of dogma. But as a, as a guy that grew up in the Novus Ordo church it always kind of especially now looking back blew my mind how it varied so much and that at the for the most part it seemed to be it seemed to be majority led by women like is it just kind of and i'm trying to wrap my head around is it just a general indifference from the men specifically from the priests like the fathers of the churches that just don't care you see altar girls you see you know uh, Eucharistic ministers, which should just not be a thing, but you see female Eucharistic ministers, you see no reverence for the church, even on like a just a basic level. And even in the traditional mass, you see all these women wearing the veils, but you know, I mean, Father Ripperger said himself too, that over 80% of these marriages are feminist. Have guys just kind of just given up and putting their hands up or they have no example to to look at and say, okay, well, this is how I, I hold myself in the home. This is how I not effectively cuck myself in my role. Like what, like how does, how does this come to be? I don't know. It kind of blows my mind because I was attracted back to the church because of this masculine patriarchy, this order. And that started with this understanding, this order of the papacy and then this order of the home. And which is, it's, I mean, that's, it's the order of the Bible. It's, it's, it's the Godhead. So, I mean, what are guys missing? Is there, are there no examples? Like, where does this come from? It's fundamentally a branding problem in a way. Mm. <laughs> what kind of messaging are you putting out and who's your target audience? There's a guy called Dr. Leon Podles who wrote a book called Church Impotent. You can get it for free on his website. Go to podles.org, Church Impotent. And in chapter six, he makes a few points that you don't hear very often, which is that the roots of feminization go back to the 13th century. And one of the examples he gives is how the language of um, bridal mysticism became much more mainstream. So Bernard of Clairvaux, he was talking about the soul being like the bride. And whereas before this had just been the church, but the, the individual soul relating to God like a bride, and this became dominant and it appealed to women in particular. So this is one of the points that Dr. Podles makes. And he finishes up that chapter we haven't got time to review all the points, but that's the gist of it. Finishes up that chapter by saying that the Western Christian has traditionally been a female soul in love with her bridegroom from that point onwards. So the language of eroticism and bridal mysticism appeals to women in particular, mm. whereas men respond more to messaging or branding, if you like, about blood, battle, sacrifice, hardship. So the Renaissance and Baroque portrayals of Christ, they don't even have the blood flowing vertically down the body as gravity would make it. It all flows towards the genitals to emphasize the, um, the link between masculinity and shedding blood and sacrifice. So if you want to get guys fired up and wanting to actually fight for a cause, making it seem dangerous and tough rather than talking about how they're like brides, is the best way to do it. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. 
Um, I, I was raised Byzantine and Roman Catholic, and you'll almost never, ever, ever hear me defend the East or anything about the East. But one way in which they did, at least in the Byzantine Catholic Church growing up, um, something my mom actually explicitly taught me was that women don't go on the altar. Women don't go near the altar. Women are women don't aren't lectors in the Byzantine Catholic Church. Again, at least growing up, that may have changed in the last few years. Um, but growing up, women wouldn't uh, read the gospel. They wouldn't read the readings. It was a man. It was one of the men from the very small parish who would carry this huge candle, a three-pronged candle, up and stand there and hold it and chant um, both readings. And then the priests obviously would chant the gospel. Women did not go on the altar. Women didn't go in the sacra, uh, sacristy in the back. So growing up, I heard that a lot, but then compare that to the Novus Ordo that I would go to every other Sunday where I was serving mass and there were girls in the sacristy putting on cassocks and dalmatics with me to go up on the altar and serve mass. And then there was women coming up to uh, read the readings and, um, uh, women in pantsuits handing out the Eucharist. I was just in uh, Rome about a month, oh my gosh, a month ago. And me and my friend Scott walked into a church and they were um, they had Eucharistic adoration. And so Scott and I kneeled down and Tim, I totally forgot to tell you this. We're there for maybe 30 seconds. And these women in the front row, these Italian women start singing um, ostensibly the benediction. And then a plain clothes woman walks up on the altar, opens the monstrance, takes the host out with her bare hands, puts it back in the uh, receptacle, turns around, puts it in the tabernacle, and walks off. There was, and there was no genuflection. There's nothing. There's nothing. She was just moving what she perceived to be an object from point A to point B. And I looked at Scott, Scott and I looked at each other and we were just aghast. I was like, did, did I just see what I thought I just saw? So I think, I didn't know 13th century. That's crazy what Will said. That's really interesting, um, the shift. But whatever's happening in the church does seem to sort of be a downstream effect. But what I always thought would change things is if you saw your dad or the men in the parish being the ones and I use the word religion in like the the sense of like an action. If they were practicing religion as much or more than they cared about the football game on Sundays, or or literally anything else that I ever saw a man do, if like if 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 I saw my dad or any man get down on both knees and receive the Eucharist on the tongue with reverence, that would have been transformative to the way that I've, even if it was Novus Order, that would have been transformative to the way that I perceived religion as an act. Yeah, we were talking about this recently, Nick. Um, so it's a kind of both and that uh, there's just no manly appreciation for um, devotions anymore. And and you you don't see men like bowing to the king. The, the parishes, the chanceries, parish schools um front offices are all run by women it also sucks that all young kids if they're taught in schools are taught by women um you you want your young kids being taught by men and it's just women kind of took over everything in society including the church all the eight institutions and that feminized everything not just the church but the church was the crowning achievement but yeah, so I, I like Will calls it a branding problem. I think that's good. I just call it culture. How culture works is um, it, it's got an ex ante and an ex post effect. And that's what that's what the feminism did, you know, really when it when it came out and what they call second wave feminism, it was just a time period. It had been at work since the middle 1800s. It created a, a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy where they're like, get women into all these positions. Well, once women get there, then men no longer want to do them. So mm -hmm. uh, I remember a, a close male relative of mine who I looked up to said, I like other prayers, but the rosary seems like a girl prayer. I was like, oh, it's not. I mean, it's literally 
um, you know, been considered a weapon at various times um, since um, I think it's, it's blessed Allen is really where we got the rosary. It's not so much St. Dominic. It's blessed Allen who, who knew everything about St. Dominic. And it's, you know, comes from him that look, it's, it's been a weapon and um, men just get this wrong. They think that it's girly. So I would, I, but I, you can't, I also say at the same time, I agree with everything all three of you said. Simultaneously, you can't ignore that it is a late 20th century specific attack that was planned out. Heaven knew about it, evidently. And, um, you know, to the extent that that the late 20th century attack on the, the liturgy was planned, which did happen at Vatican II, there were no female doctors in the church until after Vatican, a couple years after Vatican II. Then they made four over the next, like, you know, 15 years or something. And all of a sudden we have four. Well, how is a female a doctor of the church as a de, de fide thing? The Bible says women may not teach. What is a doctor? Doctro. Uh, teach. Teacher. <laughs> there are four now officially recognized of the whatever 27 doctors of the church there are really four four eastern and four western real doctors as far as i'm concerned and they're all men but there is and, and then you have francis sort of crowning it all he's the apotheosis of it francis just comes out and says the quiet part out loud of from all the post-conciliar church he's just like the church is too masculine we're gonna smasculisare is to demasculinize uh, this is the goal is to demasculinize the church. And all these morons out there that Pope explained that said, well, in the, you know, in the sort of bimodal Christology, Christ is the man and the church is the girl. So the church should be the girl that will know. But it's a, a like two is to four is four is to eight. When it comes to the church, it's a patriarchy. It's, it's receptive re with regard to Christ's activity. He does all the action. And that the receptivity is female, but all of the men who actually do the action regarding uh, church work are male. And so, so Francis just played right on that and, and idiots fell right into it. He, he says what he means and he's, he's going to make um, um, women deacons, maybe, maybe not um, vocational deacons, but it's, it's all pretty out there and plain to see at this point. That's what Francis has done for the, the post-conciliar church. If I could make a quick biology analogy, or it might not even be an analogy. It might be somewhat useful to this idea of feminizing the church, but the conception of what masculinity means um, has absolutely been maligned over the last several years, the last several decades, yeah. but especially since we've had somewhat of like a medical, quote unquote, medical understanding of things like testosterone. You always hear, oh, boys will be boys. Oh, that's just high testosterone behavior. There have been a few research studies done that have controlled for testosterone levels and compared cortisol and estrogen levels of groups of men. And when testosterone is held steady, what they find is the feminine or effeminate traits of emotional ability, cheating, violence, and talking go up when estrogen and cortisol go up, when testosterone is held constant. Masculinity itself is level, it's prudential, it's calm, it's decisive takes control of situations it de-escalates it's not this frenetic violent um irresponsible imprudent carnal behavior set of behaviors and so when the church is being described as too masculine and it needs to be uh feminized what i think they're thinking or at least i mean who knows it's probably evil intentions but the the presentation of this idea is that we're going to move from toxic masculinity, which is actually very effeminate, biologically and culturally very effeminate, toward impotency, which they're saying is femininity. When in actuality, true patriarchy and true masculinity is all of these virtues that they're claiming to be moving towards 
just prudence and responsibility and gentleness and, and, and so on and so forth. You see it in all species as well, like hierarchical pack species, whether it's elephants, lions, whatever, when the dominant one is around, the rest are all calm. Like the studies on the little male elephants that grow up without a bull around, they're chaotic. They don't know what to do with themselves. But when the big one arrives, it's like, okay, I know where I stand. Time to calm down now. And that's what men deeply require. And when you actually take that away and they don't know where they stand, there's no one to keep them in check, then it becomes chaotic. Why do you think that you can find a tremendously high correlation of homosexuality and fatherlessness? and atheism with fatherlessness. It's exactly what Will just described. You're, they aren't achieving what they think they're achieving by extirpating this uh, the concept of masculinity that's actually just like neurotic effeminacy. What it's just fallen of... male nature. It, it was, sorry, Tim, go ahead, go ahead. No, sorry, Mike. I, I was just going to ask you guys one by one what portion of um, parish priests in North America you take to be... Um, skittles man i i I, because i i'd i've always had the number pegged between 75 and 80 percent that high yeah that's what that's what most that's what most people think that have looked at this um like actually skittles are just effeminate not just effeminate we're 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 you know ssa would describe themselves as ssa whether they're active or not Yeah, I was gonna say probably put probably put it around at least half, fifty to sixty percent. I was gonna say half. Yeah. yeah. I also don't have like a large sample size. Well, I, I, I do know that never um, had... X, Go ahead, X, Will. X gays outnumber gays. If you look at the stats, Neil Whitehead's research on that is very little known. X gays outnumber gays, so glory to God. So there's hope for them if they are SSA. You can, it's just a phase. You can, you can grow out of it. That's, Certainly. That's true. But it, there's, you know, the previous um, vows they took, they were, they were ruled out if they were ever SSA, any sexual disorder for most of um, the history of Roman Catholicism. And they're, they're, they're kicked out of the seminary. Have you ever had a serious sexual disorder? And then that, that one, um, you don't have to be St. Peter Damien who, who says some crazy, crazy stuff um, to, to be like, well, if you, if you were ever SSA, no, thanks. We, we can't, you know, we can't deal with you. Um, well, well, they made it not a disorder and you kind of, you can sort of figure out when with television where um, I was just started watching Sherlock, which came out in 2010. The first season came out in 2010 and the it takes place in modern day and there's interactions between Sherlock and Watson and then like the waiter or the bellhop or something and they'll imply that they're gay and then they'll be like we're not gay but if we were that would be totally fine will you're sniggering <laughs> yeah it just makes me laugh you see everybody don't you it's like a, i'm surprised when i see something and there isn't any of that in it it's everywhere, but it started transitioning from it's shameful to it's totally cool if you are, we're just not to everyone is. And I think that the entire full transition happened in about 30 years from like 1995 to 2024 ish. Um, so I, I would imagine that the priests, when they're like, do you have a serious sexual disorder? We're like, well, no, I'm not disordered. I'm just gay. It went from a disorder to a, an orientation to a lifestyle. And this was deliberate. If you guys check out the book, After the Ball, How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of the Skittles in the 90s. I think these were two Harvard professors that were both Skittles. One was like a marketer and the other one was a psychologist. <laughs> and how they've effectively they've effectively like wedged this in and they've 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 lumped themselves in with you know marginalized groups and they've effectively jammed 
the Western conscience and psychology, because anytime we, you know, we speak about them, we have to like, pre- hey, well, you know, I, I love Skittles people. I'm not going to say to I, I have I have uh, friends that are Skittles. And, you know, Pastor Vody Bauckham, he's a Protestant pastor, but I think he's very based. Mm-hmm. He did a lot of uh, work around this particular book and kind of outlined it extremely well. And he says, imagine a priest or, you know, pastor going up and saying, well, okay, listen, guys, I'm not going to, I don't want to slander adulterers. I love adulterers. I have friends <laughs> that are adulterers, but we've been jammed so hard with this thing. Yeah. It's been, it's been such, <laughs> it's been such a slow creep and you see how deliberate it's been. And so on the back on the topic of masculinity, when you have the apex of like worldly masculinity, when you detach it, which I think is more like just machisto machismo, uh, fallen male nature, because it actually is quite effeminate. Um, because there's, you know, um, quickness to violence, no uh, temperance or restraint around, uh, uh, you know, concupiscence. And so you have this like unrestrained male nature, you know, post fall type of deal. So without Christ, that that hinging to virtue, it's, it's impossible. So the, the apex of worldly masculinity is the way of men by Jack Donovan. Who is mm-hmm. who is himself uh, one of those, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Will, yeah, you did a just an absolute dissection of that book a couple of years ago. That's still one of my favorite things I have ever read, dude. You 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 destroyed you destroyed him. The way is gay. That was it. It's, it's called the way of men. I just did one called the way is gay, and uh, he tells. I remember that. Like, it shouldn't be a surprise, right? He he says what he is on the tin. I think he was like a a pole dancer in a gay club for a bit. Um, so. <laughs> He probably won't mind that I'm saying the way is gay, right? It's uh, something to be <laughs> to be proud of, as they say. But yeah, that's it, Mike. Basically, not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, I just looked. <laughs> I just looked that that famous episode of Seinfeld, the "Not that there's anything wrong with that" episode called "The Outing," aired on February 11th, 1993, and that mm-hmm. is. Um, so uh, the, the big thing is um, a journalist, I think NYU journalist Jerry's trying to hit on. Uh, she's meeting him in a in a, the coffee shop, and she hears Jerry and George pretending to be like boyfriends to each other. I forget why they're pretending to be boyfriends to each other for some other thing. And she comes to the coffee shop the way reporters do sometimes, sort of incognito. And so she sees them and then she later gets up and comes in and she sees, oh, this is Jerry Seinfeld. And so she, she ends up in her article outing him and he's like, I, I am, I'm outed. I was never in. <laughs> and um, throughout the whole episode, every character, it, this was the real cultural transition in America. Every character, Jerry and George are, are horrified. They don't want to be known as, as uh gehaze. So like, ah, I'd like that's, you know, I everyone's going to think I'm gay. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Like every <laughs> character says it, you know, so that was the pivot where yeah, they're like, yep, yep. You're, yep. you're acknowledging that men, that's, that's a horror to be, have a, a NYU or otherwise article printed on you saying that you are, that you are gay. Um, but they had to start saying the, after the ball thing, no, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that. And the other, the big, um, kicker with that after the ball book that you cited mike was the thesis of the book is the way you get this horrible horrible thing um in front of the american public is for a couple decades starting in the 90s you don't try to make it a good thing you just make it another thing in american life yeah. which is why you went from one character who was skittles in every show to two to three to four now it, it, it you know now they're saying it's a good thing i mean francis francis's church um all of his lieutenants in the church are trying to put it in documents that we have to recognize the positive elements of it um but but it didn't start out that way um it's just another thing they can be wacky characters at first then once it got a little more mature you have oscar Martinez in the office, who's one of the smart people in the one of the non wacky people he's stable he's got his life together and he's he's lavender so you start pushing it as a good thing after you just have pushed it for a decade or two as just another thing that's after the balls thesis we have to recognize the proximal goods of adultery 
Right. Yeah. And it's not just it's not just that it's a good thing or just another thing, that it's also the superior thing. The cooler characters, the wealthier mm -hmm. characters, the mm -hmm. wittiest characters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, get associated with these Skittles and the Skittles lifestyle. And then eventually it becomes almost like it's a more virtuous uh, variant to the family where you start seeing them as married couples with the adopted children. And you don't, right. it's such a slow creep where unless you're really seeking the truth and you have the protection of the Holy Spirit, because man, that interview with Jordan Peterson and Elon Musk perfectly encapsulates what happens when there is this in incredible IQ, incredible IQ with no protection and no grounding that comes only from the Holy Spirit. Listening to these two guys talk, I, 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 I couldn't. The only way a guy like Musk gets tricked into his child being, you know, succumbing to the woke mind virus and transitioning um, is because he doesn't know God. He's a cultural Christian. And the same thing with Peterson. Like the more, the further, the more he tries to describe God without being a man of God, the further <laughs> he gets away from it. The word salad just gets more and more and more intolerable. It's the a only clip uh, from that interview that I thought was not insufferable, even though it took him almost a full minute to say it was he did say that the symbol of masculinity in the West is Christ on the cross. And the symbol true. of femininity in the West is not a woman. It's a woman with a child, which mm -hmm. props to him for saying the two truest things you could possibly say. That's wonderful. It's not even just the the real kicker to me, because you could say Christ on the cross, which is a pretty radical thing for him to say, but that a woman is not feminine without child, that that is what actualizes her femininity. So even though it took him a minute to say it, really cool that he did. That um, after the ball book is really hard to find, really expensive. I wrote an article on it a while ago and just took out some of the main quotes that I thought were important. I just want to read some out now. And to bring this back to feminism and the weakening of the church, as you're listening, can you just change the language from pertaining to homosexualism to feminism, right? Is the same process that you go through. The trick is to get the bigot. That's you guys. You're all bigots. Mm -hmm. The trick is to get the bigot into the position of feeling a conflicting twinge of shame because of his self-image as a well-liked person. Like, you don't want to be mm. mean to women. Come on, mm. bigot. They want you to believe it's more important to be liked than to tell the truth. That's my comment on it. So the tolerance there is a Trojan horse. The second you start caring more about being liked and maintaining this self-image of definitely not being a bigot, we wouldn't want to do that, then they've already got you. Propagandistic advertisement can depict homophobic and homo-hating bigots as crude loudmouths and assholes who are not Christian, okay? Same thing works for anybody who's anti-feminism. You don't want to be grouped into that category, so you better watch your step with what you say. So they show the bigot social consequences he would find unpleasant and scary. You want to say that you're the head of the household and that your wife's supposed to obey you? Well, be prepared for some social consequences that are unpleasant and scary. And if you can't face that mob, if you've already been broken mentally before you've even begun to open your mouth, you're already canceled. You don't even need to come for you. You've canceled yourself. When the bigot sees someone like himself being disapproved of and disliked by ordinary Joes, he will feel just what they feel and transfer it to himself. Did you see what happened to that guy when he said he was anti-feminist? He lost his job. I don't want that to happen to me. I better just keep my mouth shut. This wrinkle effectively elicits shame and doubt. Hey, you Excellent. know what? I, tr let's start bracketing some bits in the missile as well. Don't don't even have the, the priest say it because they're afraid to say it too. So the social shaming is how both, both operate. And it started with feminism. This is Tim's point that no one talks about really still, except Tim, is that the root of it was feminism. The rest was just like an aftershock. Our effect is achieved without reference to facts, logic, or proof. Who cares about any of that? 
but through repeated infralogical emotional conditioning. Because if they can get you to live in your emotions and just fear the whole time of how you're being perceived and the social shame, that's all they really need. So you're not actually dealing with um, reasonable people. They're not trying to reason with you and convince you logically that feminism is a good idea or homosexualism. They're just trying to scare you. That's it. Next one. Propaganda relies more upon emotional manipulation than upon logic, since its goal is, in fact, to bring about a change in the public's feelings. So the last thing that we want to do is hurt women's feelings. <laughs> now is that you don't want to hurt the feelings of the homosexualists, but it happened before already. Don't offend women. We can't do that. So we better not say the truth. Don't teach what the church actually teaches. The objective is to make the very expression of homo hatred, brackets, feminism, so discreditable that even intransigence will eventually be silenced in public. How many other Christian voices are there doing what we do on CMASK? And what are the consequences of doing it? I can think of some pretty big channels who don't say what they should say if they were committed to saying the whole truth. They know exactly what bits to leave out because of what After the Ball is saying here. So, sorry for the long speech, but I just wanted to right. bring that out into the open because the mechanism is the same. So, Will, that's that's great stuff. I Really great stuff. Whenever you talk longer, it's better. I would say um, it doesn't even have to be as explicit as opening the public politics discourse book, you know, that that thing when you're like, oh, I'm doing water cooler talk at work. Now I'm actually talking about the election debate last night. Politics or religion, boomers are going to cringe. It doesn't even have to be that. It can be something, this happens to me. It can be something as simple as um, you're talking to a buddy and he's like, oh, well, we should, we should get together. I'll, I'll go ask my boss. You go ask yours. And I'm like, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, I can't stand for that. Like, no, I, I'm not, I'm the boss. I, I don't really leave my house very often, but because I like hanging out with my wife, as many people know, but I, if I want to go do something, I will. It's just occasional. Um, and so you have to speak there. That's not opening the politics book. Guys, because they have the, the, the guilty consciences, will try to normalize this and they'll shove it onto you. They like, go, oh, let's go ask our wives or let's go ask our bosses. You're like, oh, oh hold on. I have to speak. All right. I, I'm not, that's not as much a movement of the will and the intellect as if I'm like, I'm going to address feminism now. It's just, he shoved it into my face. Or one thing was a really, really nice neighbor. I don't, I don't even know his name. Um, was walking around here and all, and five of my six girls were outside. Um, and one of them rebounds for me. One of the twins hip is always rebounding for me. The other ones are just standing around. And he's like, oh, he's walking by. He's like, oh, five, that's enough for a basketball team. And I was like, huh? And I just, I'm like, I'm not going to say the, you know, the thing. Then he's like, are you going to have them in basketball? He just kept pushing it. And he was trying to be not a really nice guy. And I was like, no. And he's like, but you love basketball. Why wouldn't you have your kids in basketball? I was like, well, my son's right there. I'm, you can see I'm training him. Um, but it's a sport, which is it's for men. Um, and, and then, then he, he got like awkward cause he'd like pushed this issue and it, 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 that the, after the ball technique does work, you just make girl sports, another thing. Remember when the WNBA first came out, I, I do, um, it was a total joke, but their goal was just be like, just after 10 or 15 years, get it to a thing that doesn't get mocked anymore. Anytime it comes up. Mm -hmm. And it works. It works on dullards and, and, and nitwits. And now they're trying to push it. You know, the last three years, they're trying to push it really hard. Oh, the, the guy also brought up one of those girls they're claiming is good at basketball. That's like just moved into the WNBA. Uh, Caitlin something. Um, call her Caitlin Jenner, right? Because it's dysphoric. Um, it is Caitlin something. Clay, Caitlin Clark, I think. And I was like, no, I mean, she's you know, whatever. I, I said something about that, but the, after the ball thing works on, you know, your, your, your priest, your postman, your Johnny six pack out there, because they don't know to just wait, but they're, you know, 
proverbial shotgun and just shoot down the clays of bad ideas as they come around. With the mimetic desire that Will described of, I don't want what happened to guy A to happen to me. Um, I think the way in which that expresses itself is through the policing of speech. And we see this a lot in the comments of if like if any of us ever swear but especially especially happens to tim a lot if you just look at his comment section if he ever swears fuck <laughs> the amount of <laughs> the amount of hate messages from adult female women or very effeminate men um comes out and what i i, I just had this conversation with um a, a friend of somebody very close to me and so it's a young woman, I don't know, 23 ish. And I was defending like the colloquial, uh, humorous, comedic expression of misogyny that you'll often have with just healthy male banter. And I was trying to explain to her um, the eminem quote like i am whatever you say that i am idea of if you're going to keep saying i'm a misogynist if you're going to keep saying that i'm a racist if you're going to see keep saying that i'm a bigot basically it's just bigotry you're telling me that i have hate in my heart over and over and over again in all these different ways you're saying everything that i do everything that i say the way that i say everything the way that i behave my personality all my the volume of my voice the cadence of my voice all these things about me you're saying i'm a hateful man i'm a hateful man at some point, guys who, who are self-possessed and they know who and what they are, they stop the pre-assertive qualifications and they stop the curating of the personality and they put up two middle fingers and they say, okay, sure, I am whatever you say that I am. And that doesn't actually change what they are because if they're truly self-possessed and truly virtuous, they don't actually become hateful. Some guys do and they, they miss the mark and I condemn that, obviously. But... Guys like us, when we engage in in humor in that way, that's I think something that must be defended. Yeah. Because if they take that away, then they've they've gotten the last bastion. And that's why you see these big channels that Will's talking about never even come close. Their language is is fraught with qualifications and caveats, just so that everybody knows that they're not who we are. We're, we're we're not like the bros, the locker room talking jocks. All right. Sorry for the technical difficulties there. We are just a few boomers with microphones and cameras <laughs> every week. This is a <laughs> this is a meme. But Will always closes off with some some fire quotes. So I wanted to actually share one of his posts a couple from a couple of years ago that had uh, quite the impact on me, and I think that planted the seed in me returning to the church. So. We're talking about the crisis of masculinity in the church, you know, why men are leaving the church. You know, um, I think a future video could be, you know, we're talking about how we get them back. But let's remember that Christ uh, is, was, and always will be the masculine ideal. And as, uh, or sorry, Will outlines in this post, here's 10 ways Christ is the masculine ideal. And I think this would be worthy of an episode by itself where we go point by point. Uh, number one, self-sacrifice. Number two, overcame fear. Number three, led by example. Number four, refused pain relief. Number five, resisted temptation. Number six, kneeled only to God. Number seven, went to hell and back. Number eight, called men to hardship. Number nine, shed his blood for others. And number 10, sent not peace, but a sword. And in the caption, it reads, Ambrose says that Christ went into the desert to face the devil of his own free will. Had he not fought the devil, he would not have con conquered him. No guts, no glory. As it says in Luke chapter 4, verse 5, it says the devil led him into a high mountain and, and shoot him, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Aquinas notes that the three temptations are those that every man must face. Number one, lust of the flesh. Number two is hope of glory. Number three, eagerness for power. According to many people today, these make a man. But Aquinas notes that the devil does not merely tell Christ, adore me, but adds that he wants to see him falling down before him. Hmm. Aquinas quotes Ambrose on this. Ambition harbors yet another danger within itself, for while seeking to rule, it will serve. 
It will bow in submission that it may be crowned with honor, and the higher it aims, the lower it abases itself. Abasement, then, is the craven fate of men who will do anything for money. Victims of vanity, they allow their backs to be broken. Such men are not leaders. Honor does not consist in cringing servitude, and once you're on your knees, you never get back up. Yeah, Will Nolan, guys, always, a smart cookie. The always based Will Nolan. So what do you think, guys? Do you think uh, number two, where we parse out that list, would be a uh, – I think I think it's a necessary conversation. I don't think we could – we could say, t- say it enough. I just want to. Sh- I want to share one one last thought. Was that I don't think any of us are like we might be dashingly handsome. Glory be to God. But I don't think we're particularly special, in the sense that I think the one thing that we all share in common is that we are sincere seekers of the truth, and that the truth hurts. And again, I'm quoting Nolan. He could have a book of quotes. The truth hurts at first, but it heals in the end. We're just sincere seekers of truth. This is what brought me back uh, to to Catholicism. I think, Tim, you've always been a Catholic. This is what allowed you to remain a Catholic and such a fierce Catholic. Same thing for you, Nick, although I know you were um, you know, an atheist, secular-minded for, for a while there, if, if I'm not mistaken. Guys, you got to pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on around us that like this slow creep of the devil is a real thing and he's there to confuse you. He's there to distract you and that we must not uh, fall victim to the nature of Adam that is embedded within all of us is this just abdication of our role, this passivity. Uh, We have to pay attention. We have to uh, impose our will driven by God's will upon the earth not just in toil, but in the leadership of our households and in our faiths. I think there was a study that showed that when a man comes to faith, 96% of the time, the family follows suit. But when the woman does, it's like 15%. That goes to show you there's this Godhead that's real. And that's at that work here on earth. Guys, you got to pay attention. You got to not just read your Bible, but go to church, be faithful, uphold the commandments, uh, fight effeminacy, understand that the world around you hates you. And it has to be patriarchy. You can't be afraid to offend that our faith is not an inclusive faith. They hated Jesus. They spit on him. The same thing is going to happen, and it should happen to all of us for upholding the truth. That's why our channels, compared to the rest of the cafeteria Catholic world, are small. Because the truth is not very attractive, but lies are very attractive, and that's why Tate is who he is, and that's why people are drawn to Islam. That's why people are drawn to these bigger Catholic pages, because it's very fluffy. The language of Christ is not fluffy it's not palatable. When he talked about uh, the people consuming his flesh, why does this shock you? We forget that. We forget that about scripture. Do you guys have any closing thoughts before we head out? The ten, list of 10 would be a great episode, um, especially the nudge in there, which we brought up last time, that ambition isn't what people think it is. That's really telling because the two things that stopped me from coming back to the church, I've literally written this down two, three years ago and talked to Tim about it was the first is the effeminacy of the church. And the second was, I didn't know that I could be a Christian and achieve my ambitions. Those are the two main things. So the fact that whatever you read from will addresses both of those is really stunning. I would just close by saying, uh, Mike, I actually, I was out of, I mean, I was out of the church for many years too. Um, as a cradle Catholic, I have to count myself reverted, n- not a not a continuous uh, thin blue line guy. There aren't there aren't many, and the reason there aren't many good, faithful, you know, on fire Catholics today who are thirty five or forty or thirty or whatever, and just have been on. F- fire and faithful the whole time is because of the fem- the feminism in the church, the effeminacy in the church pretty much did what it was geared to do. I didn't talk too much about my real view. I, I, I do think it was absolutely planned. It was an architectonic. Um, everyone else had such good thoughts. I just laid back a bit today, but I mean, I went to a Catholic grammar school um saint francis i went to a catholic middle school saint mark's i went to two years of catholic high school jesuit none of those people if i were to go get on facebook i haven't done this in many years but go get on facebook and they're none of them identify as catholic anymore it's because like no i mean like one i have one friend from jesuit who still identifies as catholic and i mean i'm not saying i'm just saying out of my group of friends or the people i knew 
but that is representative. Um, when you turn over schools and the church and the chanceries to women, men don't want it. No, men and women don't want to do it. When you when men run things, everyone wants to do it. Mike, you cited the statistic of uh, church going attrition rates. It says everything. So the goal to smasculisare the church to demasculinize it is evil and and it, it's it's concomitant with the alpha and the omega of satan you know the original sin and and the final attack on the family mm -hmm. and it's just gender dysphoria it's making girls think they should be doing church stuff and making guys think they should and it's evil and, and it's it is not more complex than that like when when girls see guys playing basketball baseball football they're like i, I think i want to do that and of course guys when guys see guys doing it they want to do it when you everyone girls and guys see a girl sport like field hockey no one wants to do it and it falls by the wayside people don't want to do girl stuff guys are girls people want to do guy stuff so the gender dysphoria only works in one direction girls wanting to do guy stuff and so when they start to do guy stuff guys stop wanting to do guy stuff and then they start thinking it's girl stuff it's 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 not more complex than that um you know, I, I did the, the devil is a kind of galaxy brain, but he works simply. He just the psychology that it takes to figure out how effective this will be a, a, against a bunch of midwits is is an effective intellect, but it's simple. So I would say that's the concluding thought. It's it's that simple. People want to do guy stuff. Beautifully said, gentlemen, this was a great one. I got I, we have to do a follow up. Um, Pray for me and my family. My daughters are getting baptized this weekend. And uh, to the C-Mask loyal listeners, I think it'd be cool to mention that uh, Will and Rachel Noland are my eldest daughters, godparents, God willing, and Tim and Stephanie Gordon. Love you all so much. My youngest daughters, godparents. Nick Stumphauser will be flying in as a stand-in uh, at our baptism on Sunday. It's uh, the way the Lord works is so beautiful, just that his divine providence never ceases to just blindside me in, in, in amazement so glory to jesus christ there's no masculinity without christ i love you guys very much and deus volt